Welcome aboard to NJ.com and Cleveland.com. Chat here as we get ready for Rutgers and Ohio State. A, a pretty big Big Ten game on Saturday afternoon. We knew Ohio State would be good. Uh, we didn't know Rutgers would be any good at all, but they've turned out to be a decent team so far. With us, we have Dan Duggan, NJ.com, covers Rutgers Athletics. And we have Ari Wasserman of Cleveland.com. He covers Ohio State. Guys, how you doing tonight? Good. How you doing, Joe? How you doing, Ari? I'm doing really well. We're on our way back from Chicago for Big Ten Media Day, so I'm in the middle of nowhere, Indiana, in some McDonald's. In a McDonald's. This is, we don't spare any expense on our budget here to put these chats together. All right, we'll start with Dan. We'll start with Rutgers. For everyone watching from Cleveland, uh, I think they thought Rutgers would stink. Does this nice thing stink? I don't think they stink as much as we thought they would. And we have Ari Wasserman. You know, I think that – Ohio it State might Chris actually be pretty good. Um, you know, five and one is, is tough to argue with, and uh, you know, obviously that that Penn State game kind of stands out as uh, as a bit of a disaster. But other than that, they've, they've played pretty well and obviously riding pretty high up that Michigan win. So I think five and one is probably better than anyone could have expected at this point. And uh, you know, obviously things are about to get a lot more difficult. So we'll see how it goes from here. All right, how about Ohio State? Four and one here. Uh, when they lost that game to Virginia Tech a couple weeks ago, it looked like maybe this team uh, would struggle, but they've they put together three big games since then. Yeah, you know, the Virginia Tech loss was kind of a product of having a youthful, inexperienced quarterback starting in a situation he wasn't expecting to start in, I think. Um, they had the ball three times after being down 21 with a chance to tie it in the fourth quarter, and they couldn't even get a first down. I think the JT Barrett that you see now is not the same quarterback he was back then. They scored 50 points in three straight games. The offense seems to be hitting on all cylinders at this point. And, you know, Ohio State's just looking for a challenge at this point. You know, nothing against some of the uh, teams they've played already in the past three games to try to get over it. But Kent State, you know, Maryland, uh, they're not big challenges. So it's kind of hard to gauge whether Ohio State's kind of clicking right now or if they're just playing bad teams. So Rutgers is coming in, and a lot of people have a lot of respect for what they've done so far. And if they could challenge them in Ohio Stadium, then maybe things will be different. But right now, Ohio State's playing really well. Let's talk about the quarterbacks, guys. It always comes down to quarterbacks. You know, maybe the pros more than college football, but still, it was, the quarterbacks play a big role here. Uh, Dan, as we know, you know, around NJ.com, Gary Nova's up. He could be down, but you look at the numbers. He's having a pretty good season here, and I know Ralph Friedgen is, is certainly making an impact. Yeah, I remember we had that therapy session in uh, the chat a couple of days after that Penn, <laughs> that Penn State loss, and all the Rutgers fans were ready to jump off a ledge. But I think sometimes we almost take it for granted because – no one's making that big of a deal about how well he's playing, but then you look at where his numbers stack up nationally in the Big Ten, and, and he's up there in passing efficiency and completion percentage way up this year, and yards per attempt, I think he leads the nation. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stats that kind of jump off the page, and definitely not what people have come to know of Gary Nova here, because even when he's been high in the past, it hasn't been this consistent, and, and like the Michigan game obviously was a career best, so I mean, he hasn't touched that level before. So, I mean, he's obviously, we've, we've you know, talked a ton about Ralph Frege's impact, and I think where maybe you probably saw it more than anything is just the way he kind of let Gary rebuild after that Penn State game. You know, he didn't throw him right back into the fire. They ran the ball a ton the next two weeks and with high percentage passes, and, and Gary, you know, kind of got readjusted and didn't, you know, didn't have that meltdown that everyone kind of has come to expect. And then all of a sudden in Michigan, he had to go win the game, and he was able to do it. So I think that you give Ralph a lot of credit, but I think you give Gary a lot more because, um, you know, everyone's kind of written the script about him, and it's tough to try and turn that. But, you know, at least the last three games, he's done a good job of doing that. How about the other side, Ari? You watched this JT Barrett. You mentioned him a few uh, minutes ago there. Uh, when Braxton Miller went down, uh, a lot of people kind of just said, all right, Ohio State, they're going to have to struggle here at the quarterback position. But, you know, Barrett has really come along. For Rutgers fans, maybe they haven't seen much from what should we expect when we watch this game on Saturday? What kind of quarterback is this? Well, what's interesting is that when Braxton went down, people were worried about the quarterback position because they were afraid they were going to lose because of it, and they already did. Now, the culture out here is different. When you start losing games, one loss is too much, especially for a team that wanted to make the playoffs. So they've already kind of paid the consequence for it. Now the question is how much he's improved since that time. And uh, what you're going to see is uh, I don't know how much uh, Rutgers fans were familiar with what Braxton Miller did the best. I mean, he was a national player, so I'm sure pretty well. He was a freak athlete that could make plays out of nothing. He could turn broken plays and 
make one person miss and jump, you know, dart down the sideline for an 80-yard touchdown. J.T. Barrett's not going to do that. What he does is he stays in the pocket. He needs to be protected, and he has to distribute the ball to Ohio State's five-star skill players all over the place that are going to make the plays for him. So um, the, the good thing that he's been able to do the last three games uh, while they've scored 50 points is avoid turnovers. So Ohio State needs him to do. Ohio State's been able to establish their run game to take the pressure off of him, and he's been able to, again, distribute distribute the ball to people who can make the plays that Braxton Miller was supposed to make this year. Guys, this one's for both of you. We'll start with Dan, then we'll go to Ari here. You know, 4-1 and one Ohio State, 5-1 and one Rutgers. I think it's easy to say, you know, these teams, maybe we're going to get a pretty good game on Saturday. Vegas, in their hand, thinks they're three scores apart. Do you guys think there's that big of a gap heading into this game? Dan, we'll start with you. Is there a three-touchdown difference in your mind right now between Rutgers and Ohio State? Uh, well, I mean, I can see where Vegas is coming from. I'll put it that way. I mean, the, the Rutgers players have said, you know, they want respect. And that's, you know, it's fine. They have that chip on their shoulder. But you have to earn it. And, you know, they're off to a nice little start. But it's a, it's a much different scenario to go into, you know, the horseshoe and beat Ohio State. You know, the, the, you know winning, beating a down Michigan team is nice for Rutgers right now. And it's all a process in their building. But and there's no reason for someone on the national stage to respect them and expect them to go in and give Ohio State a game. I mean, what Virginia Virginia Tech is an anomaly. That's what Virginia Tech did is an anomaly. That's not the norm. That doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, three touchdowns might be a little high, and I can understand why that might be a bit of slap in the face to a team that's five and one. But there's not a lot to go on to say that, oh, Rutgers is going to go in there and this should be a, a nip and tuck game. Now, if that happens, obviously, you know, we'll all be wrong again, as we've been a number of times with Rutgers this season. And we'll have to obviously change our views going forward. But I think, you know, they should be big underdogs against Ohio State until they prove otherwise. You know, the interesting thing to me is, does Rutgers do the things that Ohio State has a hard time with? So right now, Ohio State's weaknesses are the biggest weakness they have is stopping the big play in the past. So does uh, Rutgers have a running game that you know can sustain – some balance offensively to make sure that Ohio State just can't sit comfortably and try to defend the pass? Do they have the pass rushers that can get in JT Barrett's face? And the question is, is whether or not we think that Rutgers, based on what they've done so far this year, should be considered a middle to upper echelon Big Ten team because 19 and a half points sounds big. All I know is Ohio State's offense can put up a ton of points. It's whether or not Rutgers can take advantage of some of their weaknesses in the secondary and put up some points that will make that game really interesting. So uh, the question is is whether or not we want to buy into everything that Rutgers has done. And I'm not saying that it's not – I mean, clearly they're 5-1 and one and they deserve to be 5-1 and one and they've won. How about the keys to the game here, guys? The keys yeah. to this game on Saturday. Uh, Dan, for you, what is the key to Rutgers? You know, not only keeping it close, but if, if we're talking next week about one of the biggest wins in Rutgers history, an upset victory in Ohio State, what do they have to do well? I mean, you could really go down the line. It'd be probably a long list of all the things they need to kind of go right. But if you want to focus on one or two things, I think offensively, you know, as Ari was kind of alluding to, is, is the run game has to give them something. Um, you know, they kind of got away with it against Michigan that they really couldn't run the ball because, again, Gary Noble played the game of his life. I don't know if you want to count on that, you know, repeating itself. So they need to just get something going on the, you know, on the ground, and that's going to be a tough task. I'm a big believer that they lost a lot with Paul James. I know that's kind of an obvious comment, but – I've heard so many people say, like, oh, you know, Desmond Peoples and Justin Goodwin, you just plug them in, and the two doesn't equal one. You know, Paul James could do what both of those guys do, but better. So that's a huge loss. And on the other side of the ball, I think it's just going to be the pass rush. I mean, that's kind of been what – that's been Rutgers' strength. If you want to look at why their defense is better this year, I mean, they almost have as many sacks in half a season as they did all of last year, uh, and, it, and it masks a lot of the struggles they have in the secondary. So – Again, uh, you know, Kyle Flood's talked up that Ohio State offensive line, and you know, Ari could probably speak to it. Just from kind of reading the tea leaves out in Columbus, it doesn't seem like they're tying the offensive line out there. So it seems like that's something that Rutgers could exploit, and it's something they'll need to exploit. Yeah, when you talk about Ohio State's offensive line, you got to remember that last year's team was averaging 6.7 yards a carry, backed by four senior offensive linemen. And Ohio State's in a situation right now where they're still trying to find the right rotation up front. Uh, by replacing those four seniors. So Urban Meyer, I mean, they've gotten better. The last few games has certainly been an upgrade from the first two, the first one. But Urban Meyer said this week that people may think that they're okay on offensive line, but he's not happy with it. So 
I, I agree. I think if Rutgers can, you know, attack some of those youthful guys in the interior and guys without a lot of experience and get in JT Barrett's face, that would be the biggest thing for them. But what they need to do is they got to stop Ezekiel Elliott from running the football. Ohio State's really gained some traction getting the running game going, which is freeing up some of those fast, speedy skills players that I'm not sure Rutgers has the defensive speed to, to run sideline to sideline with, like Dontre Wilson and Jalen Marshall. So, um, you know, the keys of the game for Ohio State, I think, is to establish a run game and protect JT Barrett. And then, of course, on defense, make sure they don't have any crazy secondary breakdowns that they had, like, in the Virginia Tech game and even dating back to the last few games. And then even going way back to last year and what cost them a chance to play for a national championship, you know, six months ago. Guys, we know about some of the stars on each side. We know about Gary Nova, how well he's played. You're talking to us about Barrett. How about a player or two for each team here that, you know, the opposing fan base may know nothing about, never heard the name. Saturday night around 8 o'clock, they're going to be talking about that name, for good or for bad. Dan, for Rutgers, give us a couple players that Ohio State fans should pay attention to. Yeah, I think a guy who was really kind of broken out, broken out lately around here, but still certainly wouldn't be on the top of any opposing fans, you know, tongue is uh, Andrew Tozzilli, wide receiver. Uh, you know, you don't really know what you're getting when you get a fifth-year transfer, and he was at Kansas for all those years, which you know is basically a college football wasteland. And uh, you know, he really didn't know what his role was going to be in this offense. And all of a sudden, he's become this big play spark that they really needed. I mean, you average 46 yards a catch. That, that tells you he's doing something pretty well. Uh, and the, the biggest thing is everyone knows about Leonte Carew. He needs somebody to take the pressure off him. And so I would think now the defenses have seen, you know, two 80-plus yard touchdowns from Chazilli in the past two weeks. You know, you might have to respect this guy a little bit. You can't just send the safety to Carew's side. So I think that that should really be something that should open things up for Carew and also Tyler Croft over the middle again because – Terzilli has shown that you know he can get behind the defense, so you got to decide to respect that. Uh, defensively, I would say maybe a guy like Dave Maluski, who again, you know, Rutgers fans know pretty well, but uh, he doesn't get any of the respect he deserves, I think, because I mean, we look at his numbers. You know, they're as good as Joey Bosa. I'm not saying he's as good a player, but they're as good as Kamoko Torres, Darius Hamilton. He's right there. I mean, he's, he leads the team, uh, tied for the team lead in tackles for loss. He's second or third in sacks. He leads defensive linemen with tackles. I mean, he's just an active guy who, you know, he's, he kind of gets lost in the intangibles talk, and, and people sometimes overlook that the tangibles are pretty good this year, too. Uh, and it's a great story because, you know, obviously the kid came back from three different torn ACLs. He's finally healthy. It's his fifth year, so he's finally showing, you know, what he probably could have been doing the last four or five years if he had been healthy. But I think he's a guy that, you know, he might not totally dominate a game, but he just he's around the ball and makes, makes some big plays. All right, how about a couple guys for Ohio State? Rutgers fans, they're going to know by the end of Saturday. Um. If they follow recruiting, they might know this one, but this is freshman linebacker, Raekwon McMillan, who's been competing with uh, senior uh, Curtis Grant at linebacker, and he had a uh, pick six uh, against Maryland and almost scooped and scored at an earlier time in that game. He's a freshman linebacker that's really starting to you know, take the reins a little bit. It seems he has a, no, a nose for the football. It's always around the, the big plays, and you know, he, he's fighting for time. He's not a starter yet, but he's been – increasingly seeing more snaps every play and for every game. And I think that he's somebody that really could break out against Rutgers because Ohio State's been in need of a dominant force in their middle linebacker. You know, they haven't had one since, you know, I mean, I guess Ryan Chazier last year, but he played outside. And then, like, James Laurinaitis and A.J. Hawk and all those guys from the, the mid-2000s that really changed Ohio State. And on offense, I mean, the, their playmakers all are kind of unknown. They don't really have that Braxton Miller, Carlos Hyde guy that they had last year. Uh, but one person I'll go way off the reservation, even for Ohio State fans, and I'll, I'll pick tight end Nick Vanette. He's a junior who um, has really had to step up early on in this uh, season because Jeff Hireman, their senior tight end, had a foot thing, and he's been out for the first month. Now both of them are going to be available against Rutgers, but he's somebody that Urban Meyer has raved about the entire you know fall camp and even into the beginning of the season, and there's a chance they can try to get him the ball a few times. So. Uh, when it comes to Ohio State's playmakers on offense, all of them need to prove that they can be consistent. But uh, Nick Vanette is kind of a name that really will be uh, out, out there right now. Last one for you guys. People watching this game on Saturday, whether they're fans of Rutgers, just watching on ABC, do we have a game in the fourth quarter here? Dan? Uh, depends on your definition of the game. Like, I don't think that Rutgers will be losing 45-7 to and it'll be over at halftime. Uh, you know, I could definitely see – I mean, look at Navy. Navy played with them. I know that's, that's a long time ago. Uh, but if you're just trying to look at, you know, some blueprints, I mean, I just wrote a story that they're not going to copy Virginia Tech's defensive blueprint. But I think that they can 
copy some of those things the teams did just as far as being competitive. I don't I don't think it's a completely different plane that like I said it's gonna be four three five to seven. That said I'd be surprised if we're kinda of coming down to a two minute drill to win it. So I think Ohio State just has a little more, you know, obviously talent, depth, all, and I think all that is just gonna to start to take its toll. But say we're going into the fourth quarter, if it's a ten point game, that wouldn't surprise me at all. How about you, Ari? Ten point game in the fourth quarter, would that surprise you? With Ohio State, um and make games of it. What I think will be interesting to see is when you get towards the end of the third quarter, if it's still a game, whether or not Ohio State's depth and depth and athleticism, which arguably probably can't be matched up guy for guy with Rutgers, if that outlasts them. You know, uh, if Ohio State pulls away, you know, midway through the third quarter and gets a 10-point lead heading into the fourth and then scores another touchdown, sometimes otherwise close games have 17-point, 20-point spread differences, and it might not mean that they, you know, got completely dominated, but uh, I'm going to agree with Dan. I think that I could see a 10-point game heading into the fourth quarter, um, you know, uh, but it also wouldn't surprise me to see Ohio State put up 50 for the fourth game in a row. They've been really playing well, and, you know, the, the fact is, is I, I – I don't. I don't even know if you guys do, but I don't have much of a gauge on exactly how good Rutgers is. So, uh, I mean, either way, it really wouldn't surprise me. I don't think we know quite either yet. All right, we're gonna find out. I think Saturday will will tell a tale for this Rutgers team. We appreciate this tonight. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ari, for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for watching here on NJ.com and Cleveland.com, and uh, and we'll be following both of your work as we get closer to the game. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, guys. We really thanks appreciate lot, Joe. it. Thanks for the dealing with the technical difficulties. <laughs> no problem, man. Take care. Enjoy the game. All right. Bye. Thanks.